All right. Thanks for joining me on this um, obviously never-ending quest to understand human nature, but I'm really excited about doing this series. I have a lot of big series. I have a lot of big plans. So let's see how many of them we can accomplish. Let's go. Welcome back. Remember, we're doing our human nature series. So today we're going to talk about Buddhism. So question number one, how does a Buddhism think about the nature of reality or a general theory of existence? So some major points of how Buddhism conceptualizes this existence uh, that we're all here sharing right now are everything is impermanent. So no person, no thing, no state of mind is permanent. Everything is fleeting and subject to change. Whee! Um, the lack of a solid self. There is no self, there is no I. The thing that you think you are is uh, your ego or a belief in an autonomous self that according to Buddhism does not exist. So Buddhism says that nothing is strictly autonomous, that everything, um, including us, are interconnected and reliant upon one another. And the word that the book uses is unsatisfactoriness. So this constant yearning or attachment to things in this physical reality which causes suffering. <laughs> Life is suffering. There are four noble truths presented by the Buddha. So one, the truth of suffering, the truth of the cause of suffering, the truth of the end of suffering, and the truth of the path that leads to the end of suffering. Um, so the interdependent nature of states of being can be described by the 12 fold chain of causation. So many fun mouthfuls. So I highlighted that here to just read it straight from the book because, because. Okay, so human ignorance leads to mental formations, which lead to individual consciousness, which leads to the formation of a personal mind and body, which leads to the six senses, which lead to sensorial contact, which leads to sensations, which leads to cravings, which leads to clinging, which leads to the desire for further becoming, which leads to rebirth, which leads to aging and dying, which in turn leads to more ignorance. So it's a fun little circle that just keeps repeating itself over and over and over, unless you're able to remove yourself from that cycle, which we'll talk about later. Um, finally, there's no belief in like a specific creator God. So it's karma that is the ruler or the generator or the force of the universe. Karma is what dictates one's status, like social status, uh, economic status, upon birth in this world, and that is based on the actions from past lives. Cool. So that's reality. That's this physical thing that we're all existing in right now. How does Buddhism think about human nature? Um, so the section starts off by stating that they will be describing the Buddhist perspective on human nature via two main branches of Buddhism. I should have looked up how to say these words before doing this video, but I didn't. So Theravada, Way of the Elders, and Mahayana, great vehicle. Um, the content for these comparisons is going to be based on Pali, P-A-L-I, Canon, and the Lotus Sutra. Um, and I found this part to be pretty confusing. So I'm gonna do my best to understand my, to explain my understanding of what the book is saying. But as always, if you have further insights, feel free to put it in the comments. Um, firstly, again, there is no autonomous self or I, and there is no God or creator that is pulling strings behind the scenes. So that nullifies the whole idea of an everlasting soul. So instead of being um, what we would conceptualize in many religions as like an autonomous self or a being, each singular person is the product of five attachment groups, so like aggregates or components which together make up a human being or as the book says, which I liked a lot, um, a human becoming because again everything is always changing. So there is no constant state of existence, so you're a human becoming not a human being. Okay, so those five groups or aggregates are form, so this lovely flesh suit that I, and I'm pretty sure if you're watching this you have one too, um, which includes all of your senses, so your five senses that 
everyone agrees are the five senses, and then also Buddhism will add the mind to that as the sixth sense. Sensations, which are produced by your senses coming in contact, so like seeing, tasting, smelling, uh, the things around you, as well as your thoughts, again, coming from that sixth sense of your mind. The third aggregate is perception, so the recognition of objects that have previously been experienced through each sense. And, oh, just kidding, four is uh, mental formations, which the book defines as things like your predispositions, your attitudes, things that would make up what we would generally consider your personality. And finally, what the book describes as moments of awareness, so consciousness, um, which is also, as always, as we've been saying, um, impermanent <laughs> and dependent upon the conditions in which it arises. As it arises in. So this raises some really great questions like, are you the same person that you were 10 years ago? Um, Buddhism would say that you are and you are not at the same time. That's fun to think about. So a human is, quote, a mind, body, and a sense of self that consists of sequences of passing moments. Uh oh, la, 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 la. okay. So this section, the way that the book explained this, feels very different from that first video we did about Confucianism and that explanation of human nature because it doesn't really say anything like humans tend to behave in this way because of this thing. It just says that like, this is what a human is. So let's go ahead and see what the book says is the issue or the problem with humanity from this perspective. Obviously it's suffering, but what does that really mean? So the diagnosis, this can be explained by the four noble truths mentioned earlier in the video. As humans, we experience life as suffering or unsatisfactory um, because nothing is permanent, even those good things. Uh, and the lack of verifiable answers to like our big questions, like do we have a soul? Is or are there gods or goddesses? Um, this causes people a lot of anxiety and frustration as well as us being impermanent entities. We try really hard to grasp onto anything and everything, but if everything is impermanent, we cannot do that. So we must first recognize that life is suffering, which is the result of that craving or the grasping for things that cannot last. The way to escape the perpetual cycle of suffering is to acknowledge that there is no self and hence there is nothing to hold onto. Um, which reminds me very much of this meme I shared the other day that said something like, what are you so afraid of losing when nothing in the world belongs to you? I love that. So I kind of already started to explain the prescription for, su for this suffering problem here, um, but the third noble truth is, uh, as we said, the cessation of suffering through the achievement of nirvana, which is the extinguishing of that flame of like craving or wanting to hold on to something. So the book says that obviously describing uh, like nirvana, the state is beyond description. So we'll use the best, best words we have, the tools in our toolbox. Um, so it's a state where one is free from the distortions of reality made by the false self. So this is the ego that wants you to believe that you are a self or an I. Once you reach that state, once you're not influenced by the false self, you can just see and accept things as they really are, which is impermanent and fleeting. So, so the only reality is in this moment right here, right now, um, which you cannot hold on to. Uh, and finally, the fourth noble truth, uh, the eightfold path or the middle way to reaching nirvana or at least lessening the suffering. So the eightfold path instructs people on how to live life not based on the false self, um, and you do that through ethical conduct, mental discipline, and wisdom. So ethical con eightfold path, right? So we need eight things. Um, so ethical conduct includes right speech, right action, and right livelihood. Mental discipline requires right effort, right, mi right mindfulness, and right concentration. And wisdom includes right thought and right understanding. So this video is probably already getting kind of long. And I haven't even gotten to like my two cents. So 
I'm not going to elaborate on which what each of those means, but if you would like a separate video explaining what the text describes as the Eightfold Path, just let me know in the comments and I can definitely do that. Just remember, I'm definitely not an expert. I have no like in-depth understanding of Buddhism. All I know is what the book has said. Um, so the authors also added more explanations about the differences between the two major sections of Buddhism compared here, um, which I'm not going to elaborate on either because it doesn't really directly relate to human nature. Um, but I can't. If you want to put that in the comments, I can do that. So concluding thoughts. Earlier in the video, I mentioned how the book really doesn't say like what fundamental human nature, like the way that humans act is according to Buddhism. But later in the chapter, it does say this one thing. So we'll read that one thing. Um, okay, so whereas ordinary action is self-directed and produces conditioning karma, disciplined action performed without the burden of self will not produce further conditioned action or karma. So that's, again, how you would remove yourself from that cycle of rebirth based on your karmic actions, because if you're doing things not centered from the self, then it's not creating karma. From that, I think that we can extrapolate that Buddhism would say that human nature is to act in your own self-interest. If you disagree with that summation, like definitely tell me because that's just me literally taking one sentence and saying, this is what that means from my perspective, from my understanding of what's going on here. Buddhism is saying that human nature is to act in your own self-interest and that you need this other thing, this eightfold path to be able to act in a way that is not self-centered. So do you think that humans innately always act in their own self-interest? So when people do things that is, or do things, anything, something that is altruistic, why do they do that? Um, do they need something like the Eightfold Path or any other like religious ideology or just dogmatic views in order to behave in ways that go against their original or their true nature? Also, I find it very interesting that many of the things uh, described here as Buddhist beliefs are very contrary to the society that we currently live in. I always, obviously I'm always thinking about these kinds of things if you've watched any of my videos. Final note from me, um, the story of the life of the Buddha is told through many reincarnations culminating in the birth of Siddhartha, which is who is the one who reaches enlightenment as the Buddha. In his final human life, before reaching Nirvana, he is born as a prince who has all of his worldly needs met and is sheltered by any, from any kind of suffering from his father in hopes that he will grow up to be a great political leader. And that's the very thing that makes the Buddha seek higher knowledge um, and the thing that I see discussed in a lot of spaces where I would hang out, um, so just like politically or spiritually. Um, when we as humans have our basic needs met, do we have this innate inclination to seek higher truths, whatever that means to you? Like, what do you think? Have you ever considered ideas like this in order to decide like what you truly believe about human nature when you think on or talk about your views of how humans behave and why? Are you able to pinpoint where those come from? Like where you wouldn't you originally had that thought or like where do you see those perceptions reinforced throughout society are these things that you've ever really like taken time to consider i probably spend too much time considering it so there's that um finally obviously these are very shallow investigations into things that are extremely complex so like any ideology or philosophy or worldview is multifaceted and this is a 15 minute video on YouTube. So there's a lot more to cover there, but thanks for joining me. Um, if you have anything to add, like if you know more about Buddhism or you have questions that I might be able to like look up and find an answer for, definitely let me know in the comments. Um, thanks for making it this far. I love you. I think you're wonderful. I hope that some of this is new and interesting to consider and definitely subscribe so that you can follow the rest of our journey through the other eight yes eight I can do math um theories of human nature in this book and then also we'll move into some like media examples um probably like movies and stuff like that and then also after that um some empirical research lots of cool things coming
Um, so definitely subscribe so you don't miss any of that. And always, let's just share our knowledges. Until the next time, go forth and do great things. Mwah.